Then, good afternoon, guys. Uh, if you have a food coma uh, after all that amazing food, uh, don't worry, uh, because uh, Sigi and Lars will press the pedal to the metal and uh, will keep you awake with the talk about not just another IT project, a messaging platform uh, which leads to a change of the, in the mindset. Who are these two guys? Uh, Sigi is the vice as president for cloud and architecture at Best Secret. Before, he was at AWS, uh, Audi Business Innovation, or Oracle, and Lars, uh, a principal consultant at TNG, uh, who is like a typical TNG guy because he has a PhD in physics, and uh, he is a core architect at Best Secret. And these two guys will now uh, rock uh, this presentation, and I'm really looking forward to it. The stage is yours. Thanks. Yeah, we'll dive right into it. Before we dive into it, actually, we were wondering why so many people are here. Because there's a very interesting program, and we're just talking about a messaging platform. So can show of hands, who wants to tell us why you're here? Like, what are you looking for? I'll point, I'll point out people if, <laughs> if you don't raise your hand. And by the way, there's a couple of colleagues here who should know what this is about, so I will not point to my okay. colleagues. Okay, um, I'm here to learn about how it really is and what really the benefits are that Kafka gives you. It's interesting. So first of all, um, you can replace Kafka in this talk, probably with any properly managed messaging platform or publish subscribe. This is much more about the mindset of publish subscribe and not about the, techn uh, the technology used um, or um, it's not um, a commercial for any particular technology. But yeah, the mindset change I think is much more important than the technology. Anybody else? So who, raise of hand, who is here because of the word mindset? This is actually good news. Because you understood that good use of technology, good architecture is actually 80% people and mindset and only 20% technology. Um, I think most people who are here because of mindset kind of understand that and there's a lot of science about that. So um, it's important to understand that, that you can even have bad technology or not so good technology, but if you manage people who are using that in the right way, you are getting much better results than just by using fantastic technology but not managing people, um, especially when the technology is supposed to change things where you are. Then you need to manage people. Okay, last shall we start? Good. So we already said that a messaging platform it's a massive change in how you deal with data and the collaboration of systems that exchange data. Um, in this talk, we will talk about how we are using the usage of our central messaging platform as a massive mindset changer. So um, who are we? You already see that we are 50% of the core team of architecture at Best Secret. Um, when you see what the secret is, you may, may, may be wondering why we are only four, four people in the core architecture team. And you'll see that. I'll, I'll explain a bit how we are organized and why we are organizing in this way. So who is Best Secret? Uh, raise of hands, who, who has heard about Best Secret? Okay. <laughs> so then I will not say a lot. We just Europe's leading off-price fashion portal. We have uh, roughly one billion euro of revenue. So it's actually bigger than it seems because we don't make a lot of um, noise in the market for obvious reasons. Um, so um, that translates to roughly 1,700 people, um, several hundred people in tech, uh, close to 200 developers. Um, so we have quite a large group of people um, that are inspired by how we do how we use systems, how we do technology, and whom we manage as architects as well. Lars, can you give me the next slide, please? Thank you. So 
Um, this is about how, how we are organized and why it matters. Our organization, Best Secret, consists of independent, as far as feasible and sensible, um, business units. Uh, we have our web shop, of course, it's a central part, logistics and uh, demand and supply management as the big business units. And we have Tech Foundation um, as, a, as a supporting unit for everything that's overarching. The um, uh, development teams belong um, to the business units. We have roughly 25 development teams in different business units. Um, and Tech Foundation operates anything that is cross business units. So the ERP systems, um, uh, infrastructure, cloud platform, and also our architecture is uh, one of the units that helps keep things together. Our, our image of a good architecture is actually that of a German Autobahn. Um, everybody will think German Autobahn means freedom, <laughs> but the freedom comes at a price. <laughs> you know, you can drive as fast as you care to, and it's actually very safe, but it's safe because there are guardrails and there are actually draconian rules. You can only drive in one direction, you cannot exit wherever you want, and so on. So a good architecture is built like an autobahn. Everybody can drive as fast as they care to, but you need to have a driver's license, and somehow you need to build some guardrails, and you need to build the autobahns to get people from A to B. But freedom and independence and autonomy is the key driver for us. Okay, so I need to start with a slightly technical slide. I mean, you have a talk by architects, so I cannot spare you the boxes and arrows. <laughs> but um, we have used the word public subs publish, subscribe, and we just want to make sure that we are all a little bit on the same page. So a lot of um, enterprises use synchronous messaging patterns where actually a client is initiating some communication. Can you give me all your orders or all new orders? I would like to have them. And now very often I see tailored contract between two parties. So you have a lot of peer, -to -peer connections. You have a lot of APIs that are purpose built only for one specific thing. In publish subscribe, we try to go down a little bit different route. So I mean, we are a little bit technology agnostic in this talk, but let me just use the lingo. You have a Kafka topic, which is basically a log where you can push messages in. You have a producer that produces data, and you can have uh, almost as many consumers as you want that can ingest the data. What are two main benefits of asynchronous, me asynchronous messaging pattern? First of all, it can be extremely high performant, which is not the most relevant driver for us, but it's actually the loose coupling between these teams and these teams. So this loose coupling, we will see this later, it really enables a lot of cool stuff. For instance, a producer can produce messaging, uh, messages without a single consumer being present. And vice versa, a consumer can actually subscribe to data without knowing details about the producer. And even if the producer is down, for instance, it can still consume messages, and of course, until the topic is dry. And so if you design this correctly, you can have a very low coupling between producers and consumers, but we are aware you can also make um, strongly coupled asynchronous messaging. <clears throat> just very briefly, this, this should be interactive. So if you have questions, just raise your hands or just shout out, right? If you don't understand anything or you have some detailed questions, um, we are fully prepared to answer questions or engage in a dialogue in this. Um, it should not be boring. As David already talked about the food coma, so we want to try to keep you engaged. <laughs> so why, why does mindset matter? Um, each person sees the world through their unique lens. And this lens is called mindset. It's actually biology and um, psychology. Um, and it's important because it provides filters and assumptions that simplify life. If you wouldn't have those filters, we could not survive because uh, your brain would have to process all of the um, um, impressions and before you can react to the saber-toothed tiger, the saber-toothed saber tiger has eaten you. So uh, evolution created that for, for us to be, a, uh, to be able to survive. Um, it helps us to set expectations um, and plan for the worst, of, uh, guide decisions based on these assumptions and such. So it, it actually helps us to 
be fast enough for the world. Human communities function um, based on these mindsets. Um, the communities inform the mindsets and mindsets inform the, um, um, the, uh, the, the, the communities. Um, a, con and com a community's culture is um, basically formed by the mindset of the uh, members of the community. Um, I, I actually stole that from an article published by the Stanford University, so this is not something I cooked up. Um, the important thing here is um, that in a successful endeavor, like a company, it is very important that decisions are made as close to the need for the decision as possible. So typical top-down cultures are perceived as very slow and, and often reacting too slow to the needs. Um, if you manage to to get decision making to where the problem is, you will be very successful and fast. Um, so um, what we try to do with mindsets is we try to provide the guardrails that guide these decisions so that, uh, that you have consistency in the decisions and that people don't make decision, decisions that endanger themselves or the entire um, endeavor, the project, the company. This is why mindset is very important. Usually you have a vision that guides the direction and then you have a mindset that's guided by the vision that provides a guardrail for decisions and for a culture. And now it's kind of a break because Ziggy was talking a lot about mindset and now I have a logo here of Avro, which is a serialization framework and of Git. So you might think, Ooh, how did they get there? And how <laughs> will the talk ever recover from that? <laughs> but bear with me. So there are two very simple tools that actually help us a lot with what Ziggy did, with enabling people to take decisions as close as possible to the point where the decisions need to be made. And for us, Avro, not as a technology itself. You could replace it with protobuf or with JSON schema or whatever, but it's just we want to have a controlled way on how we define our data. Because you can just throw, I don't know, random JSONs and somebody, somebody says, okay, now I want to publish as a YAML and you as a consumer are like, what am I reading? So you can create total chaos. So we actually made the decision, we want to publish our data via Avro. But in order to serialize the data, you need to put a schema. That means a well-defined way on how your data is structured. And in combination with, for instance, Confluent Schema Registry, you have a clear picture of what you're allowed or expected to produce, and consumers know what they can expect from the topic they're reading. And why do we have the Git blob here? So we are actually having a single source of truth for all the schemas which is actually in Git. And this Git repository is owned by the architecture team. It's owned and curated by the team. That means if you want to publish a new event or you want to modify an event, and it's a domain event, we come to what that is later, you have to go through us. That sounds very directive. I mean, normally we try to provide as much autonomy as possible, but autonomy is not anarchy. So we want to apply certain guardrails to the schemas. And so if you want to make a change, we are just going to have a look. It's not a formal approval process like, okay, in two weeks, you know, we have our scheduled architecture uh, ivory tower meeting <laughs> where we are gracefully reviewing all your merge requests. But we actually need to be fast. It's actually our duty to the community of developers to curate this as, as good as possible. And if you suddenly have something like Git, GitLab, merge requests, where you can comment on this, this becomes extremely powerful because you can now negotiate over schemas and changes in a way that normal developers deal with their code. You know, they're used to it. And this is an extremely powerful combination, schemas and Git. But there's a catch. Let me give you a small anecdote. You know, when I joined the BizSecret project, I said, okay, it's very nice. We have a Git repository with 
couple of hundred other schemas in it, I would like to have a human readable documentation, like an HTML page, I can publish on GitLab pages, whatever. Okay, let me just write a small pipeline that just you know, generates this documentation. And what happened? Hmm, a lot of these schemas weren't valid Avro schemas. But that's quite a kind of bad for a single source of truth, right? <laughs> if, it, if it doesn't contain the truth. So there was kind of a black market of the correct schema. <laughs> and this actually led me to, to one thing. I wrote a pipeline. You know, I was like, let's create a linter for this. And suddenly, you had a mechanism where everything that it's checked in is actually getting tested more on a formal level. But this was a huge, this was a huge game changer because for us automation is actually key uh, to establish change. Because you can have all the nice guardrails, architectural ideas. But I mean, if you have 25 teams, I mean, you cannot stand behind every developer and say, oh, you need a semicolon there. But we use white spaces and not tabs. And Emacs, no, no. No, that's not going to work. But what you want to do, you want to automate as much as possible, and you want to bake your architectural guide rails into the automation. That means you have complete autonomy to use the automation because you will stay on the autobahn you know, with your Tesla autopilot, and it will hopefully not drive on the other side of the road or just turn around and drive backwards. And how automation can really change the mindset became very clear for me because suddenly we had a pipeline that ran on every merge request. And if you had a schema in it that was simply invalid and did not conform with certain conventions that we have, you know, pipeline was red. You cannot merge it to master. And then something happened. We had a huge integration project for a new ERP system where we had to move a lot of workflows actually onto Kafka. So a lot of new schemas had to be developed. And suddenly people realized, man, it's kind of handy that I have an automated check whether my schema is actually kind of at least formally correct. And the second click was, I think the community that deals with Kafka realized we have a pipeline here. I know a pipeline from my development project. You know, that's how we test things, how we automate things, how we deploy things. Can we actually do the same with schema definitions and data definitions? And something very cool happened. It was not controlled by, I don't know, some managers or architects that suddenly uh, development teams came and said, we actually have a problem we are facing, for instance, with the schemas on regularly in our development. But we could actually implement a check for this into the pipeline. Can we create a merge request? Yes, you can. And then people started to really value these things and it just grew because teams from all departments started to contribute to this. But of course, you can think, man, you have 25 teams you have one Git pipeline, this must be complete chaos. But you know, we are kind of curating this repository. That means we have kind of an active community where we talk about these things. That means merge requests lead to conversations, merge requests are public, other teams can actually see it, have a look. Is it also solving all problems? And basically, I just made a, a screenshot. It's probably not that important. And I wrote this part. That's how it started. And then basically some teams said, we would like to do some validations for type checks. We want to validate artificial random data that we are going to generate. We want to automate, basically, we want to hook into this pipeline with our builds. And you know, it's generating more and more value and it's really community driven because people understand the value of what is created there. It's not mandated. And eventually our pipeline is really a complete delivery pipeline. So you basically start with a schema, you say, I would like to publish an event with this schema in a topic. You have a lot of checks that actually run. And then basically you can just, via infrastructure as code, deploy it to all the Kafka instances that we actually have. That means 
you have the complete value chain from I actually define an interface, I'm able to test it to a certain degree on a really on a data basis and roll it out to all development, uh, development and uh, production environments. And that is really a big deal. But this is mindset. That is not technology. Yeah, it's the mindset to automate everything. Um, and it's a community mindset. So our architecture is a community of practice. We have, I already said, we have four co-architects, which is very little. So it's not four people who are, who are playing big brothers. We have um, uh, embedded architects, which are architects that are living and breathing with the development teams. Only 50% of the embedded architects are actually team members of my team. The other ones are team members of the development teams. And we have an architecture community of practice that's open to everybody. When we have a community of practice meeting, we have 70 people in the room. All of them can approve merge requests. It's just a four eyes principle. It's not like one elite team that, that has control over everything, but it's a large number of eyes that are, are available to actually quickly, micro and quickly um, approve merge requests which means things are very fast, and which means people are talking about these things. The one good thing that comes from that is actually that it gives us core architects a good view on what's happening in the company without us always having to take control, which is a very, very important aspect of this. The other, the other good thing um, comes from us looking at things, and when we find that, hey, there's the third topic for the same set of data, something's wrong here, we actually engage. We engage in a, in, a, in a dialogue. We ask them, why do you think you need to publish three topics? And um, especially when we started this, we found that a lot of people still thought peer-to-peer. -peer. So yeah, we have this other topic because this, com this consumer requested this topic uh, with, uh, in a special way. And then we engage and explain, no, we don't do it this way. The producer publishes one topic for one set of data, you consume. We have a um, dump pipe, smart clients concept, so you, your client should be smart enough to filter out the stuff that you don't want. And this is driven by our architecture community of practice. We have this ar community of practice because architecture cannot live in the ivory tower. Um, yeah, Our goal is to build this broad community of developers across all departments that are interested in architecture and those, all of those people can be part of our COP. We have Slack channels, um, we have um, regular meetings where we discuss these things, um, and we have fun together. Did I, did I forget anything? No. Hello? Ah, no, it's back. Yeah, the fun part is the most important thing, but um, coming back from the fun, to, to ADRs. I mean, ADRs is not a revolutionary concept, but for us, it is extremely valuable. So I think that should be in every architect's toolbox. So who is using ADRs on a regular basis? Yeah, I expected that. So what is an ADR? An ADR is basically the documentation of an architectural decision. I mean, okay, that's very trivial, but what for is for me the most important part of an ADR? Is it the decision itself? Well, the decision itself, yeah, it's actually nice to have, but what I'm really looking for is what is the context of your decision? What, um, what are other alternatives? What are ups and downs? What trade-offs did you consider? You know, these are the things you want to have documented. And for us, ADRs are a central tool we use basically on, on all different levels. They are used in a single bounded context by single teams. They are used on business unit level. We use them basically also on for high level architecture decisions. But are ADRs real architecture documentation? Well, if you come to a project and say, oh, I would like to understand the architecture. Yes, please, please read through the 352 ADRs we have. Then you will have a more or less complete picture. You know it's not going to happen. It's not a book where you start at one and you read everything. And the most valuable thing is actually the process 
and the people you collaborate with in generating these documents. And we are basically a remote setup. The secret is strategically also post-COVID a remote company. That means we need to have mechanisms on how we can actually work asynchronously. And basically document-driven work, for instance, on ADRs, is for us a crucial element in our, our work and also how we communicate architecture. It's not like here, please read this ADR, you have to accept everything, but we actually present these things also in an early stage. We invite people to contribute, to comment, to express doubts. And this is an important feedback channel because you want the people who say, I don't think so. You want the people who express doubts and disagree. And that is where the fun is actually in. More than 50% of our ADRs have been suggested and drafted not by architects, but by somebody from the larger community. And there, and there are formats, for instance, where, I don't know, in the web shop, for instance, that's for me a nice example. They have a bi-weekly meeting where they, for instance, experiment a lot with formats, how you can actually transport architecture in an asynchronous way where you have a meeting where every team is writing down, you know, what happened architecture-wise in the last two weeks. And then the meeting starts with a, I don't know, 10-minute silent reading phase where people just read through the documents. They can pose asynchronous questions. You discuss about these questions, and then there's a point where people can say, I would like to present an ADR. And this is super awesome because... I mean, I am, for instance, pretty far away from the webshop, but if I join this meeting, it is really an hour well spent because I really have the feeling I know what is going on. And as Ziggy said, these ADRs are not written by high-paid ivory architecture uh, people, but it's really proposed by developers, open for discussing in their community, which is relevant for them. So this is really powerful. And who actually knows what that is? I didn't either, by the way. I failed his test. It's the Bauhaus archive in Berlin. So why did I mention Bauhaus? I mean, my wife is actually a real architect. <laughs> so I have to at least, and she really likes Bauhaus, so I have to put that in the talk. But one thing which might sound trivial, but is also a mindset thing, is to innovate by throwing things away. Because normally, you know, you introduce the new shiny framework. You know, we have now something better here. We use now React instead of put your other disliked random framework. But we made the experience that throwing stuff away is often very helpful. Let me give you two examples. We are relying very heavily on Kubernetes. And, you know, what is a Kubernetes cluster without a service mesh, right? So we actually had Istio. But after a couple of incidents where Istio was involved, you know, we went back to the drawing board. Why do we actually need a service mesh? And we actually found out, well, from all those possibilities that Istio gives us, we are using this tiny part. So we actually threw Istio away. I mean, that sounds trivial, but it's an important mindset that you can actively say, okay, we made here a decision, let's reconsider this. Is it providing value to us? No, it is not. Throw it out of the window and replace it by, by something simpler. Because eventually, complexity is the thing that kills you. And you can kill complexity by throwing stuff away that you don't need. And this happens, I think, very rarely. It's actually one of the few times where I get very directive when we try to exercise the muscle of cleaning up and throwing things away. Um, because sometimes you have to push people to do that. Everybody wants it, but nobody wants to really spend effort um, for it. So this is where we then start pushing people, asking around, have you thrown it away? We also often have the automation in place to actually find out whether somebody still uses Istio, for instance and help them off of it. And one thing where we actually threw away a whole cloud provider 
is, for instance, our restructuring of our Kafka infrastructure. Because this is, roughly speaking, how our system landscape on a very, very high flight level looked like. We have here Azure, which is basically our main cloud provider. So we want to use Azure as much as possible. So we have here Kubernetes, you have here Kafka Connect, you have all sorts of clients that talk to Kafka in it. And you have here some other networks that can be on-premise, in the warehouse, or somewhere else. And then you have AWS. <laughs> and you know, this is not a talk about why Azure is better than AWS. But it's actually... <laughs> I have a cup. I have at least one former colleague from AWS in the room, so I'm now getting a bit nervous. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to say this is not about whether Azure or AWS is better. It's actually if you are if you are on one cloud provider, I always counsel to use this one cloud provider. Um, and for us, I've, when I joined BestSecret, I found this situation for for historical reasons. And then of course. You all will agree that this doesn't make sense. <laughs> yeah, so basically the, the point is, you know, the network is always there. It's reliable, it's infinitely fast. You know, we all know this kind of truth. <laughs> <laughs> that means that all these lines, so from Azure to AWS, from here to here, from here to here, they cost money. They can fail they cause problems. And actually, it turns out they were kind of brittle. So we had here a lot of EC2 instances running that were just serving uh, to run Kafka Connect jobs. We had here the Kafka Cloud, the managed Kafka from Confluent. So it was on AWS because at the time when the decision was made to go to a managed offering, there was no Azure offering. So actually, it made sense back then to go into Azure, but now it was the time to do the thing that makes sense today. So we said, okay, let's just throw away everything here and just move this guy here. And you see by the number of lines that we are actually having, it is a much, much simpler setup. So it is cheaper, it's actually faster, it's more reliable, and it just took us I don't know, half a year, to throw a lot of stuff away. And by the way, having this on AWS is, is at least as good as having it on Azure. So don't take this as a commercial for one or the other cloud provider. That's really important. Just go where whatever fits with you. And just want to briefly mention on how we actually move um, basically a live Kafka cluster in production in three weeks from one cloud provider to the, to the other because it nicely illustrates a few architectural guardrails we have laid out. So that is a very easy slide. So migrating a Kafka cluster is actually very easy. You have your Kafka cluster here. You start the Confluent replicator. You know it works out of the box. Super easy. And you replicate it into Azure. That means you have a constant replication. And I told you we have loose coupling between providers, uh, producers and consumers. That makes it actually very easy because now consumers can stop consuming from here and start consuming from Azure without telling anybody. So our approach was here's a two-week time window. Do whenever you want to do it. But they don't have to tell you. I mean, to be honest, I don't care. Your producer doesn't care. So if all the consumers have moved, in the second step, you just switch the producers, and that's it. So this is basically loose coupling in real life. And the second uh, thing is item potency. You know, I think if people in the secret hear me saying item potency, they're like, no. <laughs> but why is that super powerful? Do I really care which offset I have to use on this Kafka cluster? I don't care. You know, I just go back in time an hour, maybe consume a couple of thousand messages. You know, I'm item potent anyway. So it's actually super simple. I don't have to think about it. And these are two core architectural principles for asynchronous architecture at play here. 
and that made our lives actually extremely easy. You know, in real life, you know, it, it was a little bit harder than I'm telling it here, <laughs> but that's the official version. <laughs> I'd like to share something here. Um, we were talking about mindset change. This kind of endeavor um, is a huge opportunity for mindset change. And this is actually where the hard stuff comes from. So, of course, we talked about dumb pipes, smart clients, item potency, proper configuration, and so on. This thing relies on you having a configuration, at least, that is, that is separated uh, where the configuration is, uh, of the consumers is separated from the configuration of the producers. <laughs> because you first move your consumers and then you move your producers. If you have everything aligned, it's just the change of a connect string. We actually even have the same versions and so on. When we started that, there were teams that said, yeah, we will, we will do this, no problem. We had other teams who started planning and thinking, and then I, I heard messages, oh, the Kafka migration is such a huge effort, and so on. What we found out is that the migration is not an effort. Nobody, no, no development team moves any bit. Like, the, we have a central team of two people who are taking care of that. This is where the migration happens. The effort is, I'm not sure how my Kafka consumers really work. I'm not sure whether they are item potent. Oh, we have a, only one config configuration for producers and for consumers. We uncovered a lot of technical depth when we were starting this. And then we engaged and helped all the teams to sunset this technical debt. So 90% of the effort didn't come from migration, but from sunsetting technical debt and cleansing, throwing things away. And that was a huge thing. It was hugely positive for our company. We had so much collaboration, um, suddenly teams started talking with one another, like one team said, yeah, it's fine. The other team said, I have huge problems. We brought these teams together. They inspired one another. Um, we really were an agent of collaboration, and we're now almost done. So we, uh, at the moment, we are at the stage where um, our pre-prod system is already completely migrated. We are done with the pre-prod, right? And pro production, we are currently... I'm currently on parental leave. I'm not yeah. going to comment on this. <laughs> and... And in production, um, the 50% um, um, of the really tough consumers are already migrated, especially our ERP consumers had a war room day. It felt like Houston launch control, <laughs> but, uh, and they ran into some problems where they could solve all, um, all of them, and they, are, they now migrated all their consumers. So, um, but the, the biggest thing was not that we, that we did this. The biggest thing was that we had 25 development teams who had an opportunity to sunset toxic technical debt. Because if you're not item potent, if you, if you don't have proper configuration and so on, it's really hard to operate this, this setup. So we helped the company a lot with this. Yeah, key takeaways. Key, so if you don't remember anything from this talk, but these four points, I think you've taken away a lot, at least what I want you to take away. One is you need um, to generate the right mindset. Asynchronous communication is more than a technical pattern. It's a, it is a mindset. It comes with a lot of patterns. You can use a lot of patterns. It's actually, for, for instance, it's a fantastic uh, tool to use the strangler pattern. Um, you need to be brave and innovate. This is really important. Um, this kind of thing um, helps teams in a, um, innovate a lot and experiment a lot because you are loosely coupled, so you want to try some, some new tool. We have a pricing engine, and we set it up in a way that I can have three other pricing engines right next to it because all they need to do is consume the same Kafka topics. They have all the same data. We can experiment now with pricing engines. Um, then you need to work really hard to keep things not so complicated. <laughs> So keep things simple. This is the hardest work. In a community of practice, you cannot be top down, you need to convince. This is like my daily <laughs> work. I, in, in, the, in the half year where we've done that, there was not a single day where we didn't have conversations with developers explaining dump pipes, smart clients, how they can filter out, why it is important that they're item potent, uh, and so on. But it was worth it because it helped teams understand those guardrails. And then build a community. People are key. 
A couple of tools that we use is, for instance, for any larger endeavor we have, we, all, we have open, um, office hours. So um, for our cloud platform, we have um, two, office, two office hours per week where people can ask how-to questions, where we get into interesting discussions. For the um, uplift of our central messaging platform, we have um, office hours where people come and say, I have this problem. Um, where you suddenly um, can have synchronous conversations where asynchronous conversations don't really help. Like a discussion on how do I do this is not really done well over Slack or tickets. So this is why we um, had those, those office hours. You need to really cater to the people rather than to technology. This is a key thing. <coughs> and what's really important is you need to find ways to align and manage public data. Um, so we don't control things within the domains. What a, what a team or a large business unit does within their domain, I don't care um, in this sense. Um, but the data they publish to others, this is where some management needs to happen because otherwise the data are not usable. So, and, and we use Avro schemas, you can use whatever method you want, but these, <coughs> this 4i principle where the, the right thing is the easiest thing to do, that was the key thing in managing the data that domains are publishing. By the way, anecdotally, <coughs> we also do the same with documentation. We have kind of a death penalty on documenting stuff outside of your domain that is not stable and not accurate. So you either don't document or you document something that stays stable. Uh, we don't have any large lists of, of um, brittle attributes that are documented outside of the domain, for instance, because then you would have to update stuff all the time. So you either have a mechanism to update stuff or you don't update. So this is really important when you, when you want to go towards independent units that you really make sure that, that things that are exchanged be between units are either up to date or stable. And the same is true for um, your schemas. And otherwise, if you don't do that, then it's just another IT project. If you focus on technology, it's as prone to failure as any other IT project. We're done, I think. Thank you very much. So as the slide already says, you need to ask now 42 questions. Yeah. Hold on a second, before we go to the question, can you raise your hands whether your expectations, the expectations you came with, are actually met? Like if you, if you came here with an expectation and you think, now ah, 80%, raise your hand if we, if we, we need to do better. <laughs> Good, so then let's ask questions and maybe we can okay, answer. Maybe. Uh, a, a comment to my expectations. So I came here with a slightly different expectation, but you delivered good stuff. So right, so it's, just, it's not that your presentation was wrong. It's just that, you know. Um, okay, but now now to the question. So um, you were very explicit about only regulating or talking about data exchange between domains. So now my question is, what is a good scale? What is your scale of domains in, let's say, teams or people or kind of files mm -hmm. of messages? And the second thing, does this filter down? Do some domains actually do this internally as well? Or are they just big blobs of coupled APIs? So okay, so this, is, this talk was very much about the, um, our uh, central messaging platform. I think your question is, more, is broader. So we have an architecture vision that says that we focus on global optimization over local optimization, which is a very vague term, and this we have this ambiguity on purpose. We, the architecture core team has a task to convince rather than to order. And the one good thing about Best Secret, actually there's many good things, but one good thing when I joined, where I was really surprised is, if you share information that was missing before, everybody comes around. So we don't suffer from this not invented here syndrome. So it works for us because I find that when I say, hey, if you look at it from this angle, um, this, would, this would be the right way to optimize globally, people stop optimizing locally. And I invite you to trust people that they will actually see the bigger picture if you, if you give it to them. 
And if you don't, if this doesn't happen, you need managers who work on the reward systems within the company. Um, this is how I did this in the past. I didn't need to do this at the secret. So how do we do this? We, it's actually, um, the, uh, the, our business units are the large business units. So we have, we have basically, uh, if you do what the best secret does, you have a large logistics um, team. This is one business unit. Um, and you have the web shop, which is another business unit. And then you have um, supply and demand, which is the unit that, that does uh, all the buying of the goods and so on. And we have one unit that does a supporting unit, Tech Foundation, that does all, all the overarching things. So for instance, the ERP systems live there and so on. So it's, these are quite large units. Within the units, um, autonomy happens as well on a lower level. So for instance, the web shop has, the, has internally the same ADR and RFC structure. They use that as well. Um, and we encourage units if they find that something works well, to actually publish it, to, to share. We have, like today is our, our best secret tech day two, where we share these things, where we do, um, where we have fun together, where we also do hackathons, uh, other things, um, to actually share these, these things. This also translates to how we do technology management. We use TechRadar for technology management. Um, and our technology management is focused very much on giving individual developer teams technology they need in a very quick way. So, so basically the only hurdle is they need to show that they looked at TechRadar whether there is something that really solves their need. And if not, they, can, they suggest something and they can basically start using it right away, but they don't have any support from the company. So, um, and then the architecture, uh, the, the core team engages and helps them with the heavy lifting. Um, so sometimes I need to explain that knowing how to run stuff doesn't mean knowing how to code it. That's 5%. But we actually help them, okay, let's find for this and that technology, let's find out whether this is just something you use. You know, 90% of the stuff is just, we use something. You know, it's, you don't have a lot of scope here. And then we just look at it, okay, we don't have anything for that. Um, let's see whether this, whether there is a, a better thing, like commercially or, or legally, um, the use of whiteboards was such a thing. Um, we needed to pick the right whiteboard. Um, and then all the legal stuff comes in because uh, you can put secrets on whiteboards and um, somebody needs to talk with legal whether the data protection uh, clauses um, that uh, the whiteboard providers give us, which one of them would be signed off by legal, for instance. And we take that heavy lifting away from developers, so the developers can just, just need to suggest that. And we make it our job to um, give them a feedback whether we, we can use this in the future within two, two to four weeks, um, often faster, but this is our, our, our OLA, basically. Um, and then we put it on the, um, in the, in the tech radar, we put it, when, when we know we can make this bigger, we put it on emerging, and then we, we help them getting it to mature. And this way, people can experiment, can suggest something, they feel empowered to, to do something, and then we take that and build the new autobahn for this. Um, and and so, so autonomy actually breaks down to individual development units. Um, they just need to collaborate a bit. Does that answer your question? Um, I just want one, one bit more. Of course. Mm -hmm. So, so webshop is one domain, for instance. A webshop has a lot of developers, the back end and the front end. Um, 15 teams. 15 teams. So this is really a lot. And within webshop, they also they have app mobile app development, front end development, back end development, and we often group around larger topics, like for instance checkout or or um, uh, wish list or something like that. So, so um, they also do subdivisions. And the development teams are actually within the business units. Further questions? Uh, 
Um, how long did it take from basically the core team inviting to a uh, community of practice to what you described now, 70 people in the community of practice, everybody posting this is, merge this requests is and reviewing them? This is a very, very difficult question. Um, the reason is that I joined nine months ago and there was already a history. So um, the ADR culture was already, like a lot of that was already implemented, but in a very loose way because there was no core team. There were people who were more active and the people who were less active and my job was just to f form that core team and then basically shaping that a little bit. Um, and what Lars already mentioned is when, when we started this in earnest, we found that, yeah, we have schemas and we have a schema registry. However, um, not everything was Avro. And when we went full on, we found that not everybody understands that we are producer-driven and not consumer-driven and so on. So I would say six months. And um, it was a mixture of... of writing the vision, and actually the writing the vision was a collaborative effort, uh, and then marketing the vision, and then living the vision by being present in meetings. So Lars and I and the other, uh, the, the, our third core architect, the fourth one is only there, only there for two months, we spent a lot of time in, in different teams. So we did divide and conquer, Lars had some patch, I had some patch, uh, Toby had some patch, um, where we were engaging in in um, these discussions and reminding people of our core principles. So it's actually sounding like a broken record a lot. So item potency, dumb pipe smart clients, um, and so on. Maybe I can also uh, provide a different perspective on this time scale because we actually started also a, a different endeavor because we have this cloud service platform that is providing basically cloud infrastructure to teams. Um, but we had the problem, there was just too little communication. You know, people were building stuff for people they don't know, and you know, people were consuming services that did not really fit their needs. So we needed to bridge the gap. So what we said, let's make an experiment. Let's try to make something we call a guild. You know, we have different teams, community of practice, guild, but at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. And forming this guild was actually very quick. So we just asked around, hey, who are actually the key users? Would you like to participate? Would you just like to send one person to, to join us there? And we just sat together and we developed actually a vision. For instance, if you are here in this meeting, you should be a multiplier. You know, it's divide and conquer. You should bring the issues from your team to the board and relay the information back. And we will do this a couple of times, then we are going to review it, and if we see it doesn't fit, we throw it away. And, and I think now since half a year, it's a super successful meeting, and I think it's a great channel between basically the platform teams and all the cloud users, so it can actually go very quickly, but I think what is important is you need to set the right expectations. So these meetings, like community of practices, guilds, they're not infotainment, so you don't want to have 100 people consuming, but you have to set the expectation. Like, if you get a piece of information here, please provide it to your team. So you now have a responsibility, and I think this really creates this sense of community. It's not just listening to Ziggy <laughs> ranting about item potency, but it's really knowing, okay, this is some, a topic I need to own, that I need to bring to my team, and if I have problems, on the other hand, I can bring here, and stuff is really going to change. And I think if you do this right, you can really establish these communities rather quickly. And actually, there's two things that you need to realize. If failures happen. You need to really uh, realize that fa things will go wrong. Do you, you assume, you say this once, like when you're here, you're a multiplier, and then you find that some teams have the multipliers in, but later on, the teams act as, as if nothing would have, would have been said. So you need to work hard on this. You need to show backbone. Um, I once in one COP uh, meeting said, this is not infotainment. If you do not want to bring this to your teams, get out. <laughs> Send somebody else in. So, on. so it's, a, it's a balance between being very nice and, and um, convincing and sometimes also 
um, reminding people that this is serious business. So it's not easy and it's not like all shiny. Um, you really need to work hard on this and you really always need to find the right balance. Um, I, when people ask me like, how do you do that? I tell them I don't have a silver bullet. If I had a silver bullet, I wouldn't be here. I would just, I would just have my own business with that silver bullet and be a millionaire on my island. But I, have, I don't have it. Every day we need to work hard to provide with all the freedom that people have to still find the right balance for guiding guardrails and so on. And sometimes, well, sometimes we go too far, sometimes we don't go far enough. And that's part of the business. So thank you, Sigi and Lars. I think from the time as it's running, uh, we need to make the stage clear uh, for the next speakers. If there are any further questions, uh, I guess Sigi will still be uh, available maybe out outside uh, during a coffee. Uh, and then thanks a lot to the audience and uh, give a big applause to Lars and Sigi. Thanks a lot.